Open your Bibles with me this morning again to the book of Acts. Uh, I am going to start out end of 10, float a little bit through ver uh, chapter 11 and 12, and I may come back and rehearse it uh, later on uh, as we continue our journey through Acts here. But God has, has really honed me in this morning, uh, getting over into uh, the book of Acts there, chapter 13, or, uh, 12. Chapter 12 down towards the end of the chapter, but I'm gonna lead up to it a little bit before I get there and try to do it as quickly as I can But if I happen to come back next week and back up behind where I am today uh, Bear with me on that too uh, Because uh, I've got to go where God kind of leads this mind Okay, and that plays in with what we're talking about here because God orchestrates things so that he can accomplish his will in our lives and in our hearts and in his church. And that's what he's doing, and I brought that out uh, the past few weeks here, that God is doing in the book of Acts here. Uh, we, we've talked all the way through it so far about it being a, a time of transition. Uh, God's transitioning from working with the nation Israel and now he's going to work with the church of the living God through the church age. And then he, he will transition back again at the moment of the rapture of the church and going into the last or the 70th week of Daniel, what we call the seven year tribulation, when the Antichrist comes up and so on. And he'll be dealing through Israel again. Okay? But he's transitioning right now. Didn't change his mind. Didn't get you know down through the Old Testament and say oh shucks this isn't working so I'm going to have to you know change up and do something different here. No back before eons and the history back before the dawning of our earth and uh, his speaking into existence everything that is he determined what he was going to do. Book of Malachi said I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. I change not. Our God is immutable. Does that mean he does not uh, work with different segments of his creation and different times in different ways? No, it doesn't. But he didn't change his mind. It was his plan all along. Now, we've gotten down here to the... Uh, Acts chapter 10, uh, chapter 9 and 10, when, when God has really got to tweak the mindset of his followers, his people. And he has got to take these men that he worked diligently with for three plus years and tried to get them to understand how to take the Old Testament law, the Torah, uh, the, the poetic uh, Psalms, the Proverbs, how to take the prophets and the law and make it, not make it work, but work it the way that he wanted to in this church age. With the dawning of the ministry of the Messiah, Okay, the ministry of the Messiah, Jesus came to what? Seek and to save those that were lost. How did he save us? By paying the sin debt. All through the Old Testament, God had to, not developed, but he had given the illustration of what it meant to pay for the sin that Adam originally committed and the sin nature that we have and the uh, propensity, I guess that's a word, to sin that we have. Uh, in the Old Testament, he said, we've got to cover this up. It's got, to, it's got to, somehow I've got to get to where I can look upon men and I can uh, deal with men and I can minister to men but I can't do it with the sin of Adam and the sin of mankind and the original sin between us. So God said, I want you to take animals and I want you to sacrifice them in different ways at different times of the year. And for a period of time, I will look at you through the blood of that animal. 
And the blood of that animal won't take away your sin, but it will cover your sin. Okay? And I will deal with you in our uh, vernacular for a period of time. Now, God doesn't have time. We go over that all the time. There is no time with God. But he said, during this period where we're working with the blood of animals, of goats, and of, of turtle doves, and of lambs, of bullocks, I will let it cover and, and you know, keep you where I can reach you, where I can talk to you. But then the moment whenever God told Jesus, God the Father told God the Son, it's time for you to go fulfill your ministry as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And Jesus came into this world and lived and showed us how that we should walk and we should talk, you know, for what, 33 plus years. And then he went to the cross of Calvary. And there he shed his perfect sinless blood, not to cover, but to wash away your sin and my sin. Okay? Now we're in this error that God has got to get out of the mindset of people that believe in him and are trusting and following him. He's got to get their mind away from the blood of animals that covered and understanding the blood of the Messiah, God himself in human form, God incarnate, the blood from the cross of Calvary that washes you whiter than snow, that doesn't just cover it up, but washes it away and buries it as far as the east is from the west, okay? He's got to get across how you live in that un understanding and that, that sacrifice. How do we live in it? You see, the, the understanding wasn't there. We went over that a little bit last week with Peter here. And you remember he uh, went and talked to Cornelius first, God did. And he said, I need for you to do something. And Cornelius believed in Jehovah God. Uh, I believe he was a Jewish proselyte, okay? He served uh, the God of the Jews, Jehovah God. And God went to him and he said, I need for you to, to you know, you, you like me, you love me, you, you're serving me. I, I need to, you, you to do something for me and, and to send over and get Simon Peter. And, and then he went over Peter, or showed himself where Peter was. He was already there, okay? And he said, gave him that vision of the sheep being let down, all kinds of animals that the Old Testament said were unclean and a Jewish man was not to eat of. And he opened his understanding. And remember the key uh, phrase last week, that that God cleanses, do not call common or unclean. Well, that likened it with the food and the dietary laws, but it also touched, as God is going to show Peter, and we already saw it last week, that it also means the Gentile nations. God is opening up sonship to the Gentiles just like it was to the Jewish nation, okay? God chose Abraham, made a nation of him, said, I am going to take your offspring, your nation, as being my people. Now God is getting them to understand that it's not just the Jewish nation, but anyone that comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ believes on him, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. They will become sons and daughters of God. Okay? That transition is taking place here. So we see it a whole lot down through here. In the end of uh, chapter 10 there, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And that's what God wanted to get across to Peter. 
He doesn't choose people to be his children just because they're of the nation of Israel. God is not a respecter of persons. Now, he goes, and I'm not going to read it for you today because I don't want to take the time. But you go ahead and do it if you want to, and, and I encourage you to. In the rest of uh, chapter 10 there, that Peter rehearsed who Jesus Christ was. He preached Jesus, okay? His death, his burial, his resurrection. The only way to come to the Father in the church age is through Jesus Christ, okay? It was the only way in the Old Testament too, but he hadn't made the sacrifice yet. Nobody could go to heaven in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't paid the penalty. Okay, that's why whenever the rich man died, he lifted up his eyes in hell and torment. Okay, but when Lazarus died, where did he lift up his eyes? Where did he lift up his voice? In Abraham's bosom. Well, that was down there in the earth too, and it was within eyesight of Hades or hell, but it was in paradise. That's why when Jesus was hanging on the cross of Calvary before his death, before he gave up the ghost, he told that thief on his right hand side, the thief said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That thief believed on Jesus Christ at that moment. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, not heaven. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present what? With the Lord. Where's Jesus? Where's our Lord right now? He's sat at the right hand of God the Father because he ascended back to glory, okay? But at that point, it was paradise. And before Jesus died on that cross and shed his perfect blood and spent a moment in time separated from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did God the Father and God the Holy Spirit for a moment in time forsake God the Son? Because that was our destiny. That was the penalty. For the wages of sin is death. Death meaning separation from God for all eternity. Every person that you walk with, you know you're, it's your neighbor or your working companion or your family member. Anyone that has not come to that point where they see Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They understand themselves as an unregenerate and headed to hell and, and hopeless sinner. And the only way that I can even have a chance at going to heaven when I die is to accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary for me. Every one of those people are headed for a godless, Christless hell. But if they'll look upon Jesus Christ and understand who he is and believe it to the point that they say, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. You see, we're not coming out from under the bondage of sin just to be free to do and live the way we want to. We're coming out from under the bondage of sin and selling ourselves back into servitude and bondage to Jesus Christ. Okay? At that moment, whenever Jesus Christ bore that death, that separation on the cross, and then when it was done, he said, it's finished. It's finished. And he surrendered his spirit to God. God, Jesus Christ, made that sacrifice for us. Now, well, as a matter of fact, don't let me skip this part. Because here's poor old Lazarus and Abraham down there in Abraham's bosom in paradise. We don't want to leave them there, do we? We don't want them to stay there for all eternity. Because Jesus made, made the sacrifice. And the scripture tells us that whenever Jesus was in the tomb, his body was in the tomb, he descended into the bottom of or the uttermost parts of the earth. He descended to paradise and he preached a sermon. He said, it's finished. I've done it. The price is paid. 
And then he gathered up all those in paradise and he took them to glory. You know they took a break along the way. They had a pit stop. They stopped here in this world because the dead rose and wandered this earth for a certain period of time. During that period of time, Jesus met up with, uh, I believe it was Mary. You remember whenever she came and she saw him, thought he was a gardener, but didn't realize who he was when he called her name. And she went to touch him and he said, don't touch me. I haven't ascended to the Father. Then he ascended to the Father, took all those from paradise to glory. Where we're going to be one of these days. We're going to be able to meet Abraham. We're going to be able to meet Lazarus. All those Old Testament saints. Somewhere along the time in the eternity future, we're going to be able to meet them. I got a feeling it's going to be several thousand years. Because what you and I are going to want to do most of all when we get to heaven is be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Okay. But he has took them back. So now, because Jesus died, was buried, rose again, and then ascended. Now, Jesus came back to this world, by the way, after he ascended to the Father and took those from paradise up there. He came back into this world, took upon his bodily form. Well, how do you know he did that? Because there was a time when he met with his disciples, okay, and Thomas wasn't there. And what do we call Thomas? Um. <laughs> because the apostles told him, he said, we've seen the Lord, he's risen. And Thomas said, I won't believe it until I put my hand in his side and my finger in the nail scars of his hand. And so whenever Jesus met with him, he said, come here, Thomas, touch me, put your hand in my side. It wasn't like it was with Mary when he said, don't touch me. He said, no, touch me. He sat down, he, he, he ate a fish, rolled fish out on the seashore with him, you know. Jesus paid the price, our Messiah, our Lord. There's a transition time here, and that's what I'm driving at. It wasn't enough that they knew that the price had been paid. You see, there were still people, and we're going to see them. I'm going to skip over it today. But we're going to see that whenever Peter does all this preaching and teaching and, and understanding about what God tells him, he meets up with other Jewish people that say, no, no, people can't be saved unless they're circumcised. they got to become Jews to be saved, you know. And there's a lot of understanding that God has got to get across to all these people. And we're right in that. And, and Peter goes about sharing. And how does he share it? He preaches Jesus Christ. Verse 44 in chapter 10 says, While Peter spake, the words of the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. You see what's going on here? Now a lot of people take this and say, well, the baptism of the Spirit is at a different time from what the Holy Ghost uh, or salvation is. And you've got to speak in tongues to, to know that you're baptized in the Spirit. And no, we're in a transition time. It, it's going to be some time between this time, they're going to have another time that uh, people are going to receive the Holy Spirit on the missionary journeys that uh, Apollos came in and he was preaching, but Apollos was of the baptism of John, basically. He knew about Jesus and he preached Jesus, but Apollos didn't have the understanding that the Holy Spirit comes in and empowers us and indwells us at the moment of salvation, okay? Apollos didn't have that understanding. So Apollos came to a little town, he taught biblical truth, and then he moved along, and it was either Paul or Peter, or we'll get there, I'll tell you who it was, I forget right now. But one of the two of them came in after him and said, have you received the Holy Ghost? And those church members, those Christians that believed on Jesus Christ looked at them and said, we didn't even know that there was such a thing as the Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? And again, we're going to see them 
speaking in tongues a sign that they have received the Holy Ghost here okay but it's that transition time that they're going through here okay let's run right quickly uh, through chapter 11 just let me point out a couple of things we may come back and touch on it later on uh, in the first part of that is when Peter goes back to Jerusalem and he reports what's went on and there's some discussion about the fact that uh, you know these people can't really be followers of Christ because they they're not Jewish and they haven't been uh, circumcised so what does Peter do? He rehearses what went on. God appearing to him in that uh, trance, the letting down of the sheep, the fact that whenever God get, got this understanding and not to call common or unclean that which God has blessed, at that moment there was a knock on the door and here were men that God had met with a Gentile and sent them over there and said come to my house and he will tell you what needs to be done. All these things happened. And then in verse 16 it said, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 18, when they heard these things, those that were giving them a hard time about circumcision, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. In other words, an understanding came to that group of people because of Paul's witness. Okay? Then down in verse 26 of Acts chapter 11. And when he had found him, uh, excuse me, well, I'm getting far ahead of my, I told you Paul was going to come back into this, okay? I'm not going to read it, but back up there to 21 uh, down through 26, we see that Barnabas goes to Tarsus where Paul was in graduate school. Okay, how long was he in that graduate school? Three years. So we're down the road a little bit here, okay? He went and got him because it was time for Paul to take his position as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he brought him back uh, to Antioch, and uh, they spent, in verse 26, and this is what I wanted to bring out, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled, assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Uh, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In other words, three years in school, back for another year at Antioch with Barnabas, and he began to teach Jesus Christ to uh, the Gentile peoples. Okay, now, what happened in chapter 12, and again, I'm going to brush down through it a little bit. Read it for yourselves. The Jewish king, now please get your understanding in what's going on here. Who ruled the world in the first century? What nation? Rome, okay? Rome was in control. Okay? But whenever Rome came in and conquered a people, a nationality, a land, they allowed them to govern themselves as long as they paid tribute and they listened and they adhered to what Rome told them to do. Rome set up governors, Pilate, you remember him? But they had their own king. So the king we're going to talk about here, King Herod, was a Jew. He was a Jewish king. He was the king of the Jews, okay? So he was governing under Roman uh, control, okay? Now Herod was in a pretty bad situation here because there were two facets, basically, uh, in the... Uh, Jewish community and the rule of the Jewish community and they were the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, does that sound right? No. There was the king and there was the Sanhedrin. Okay? And they both had a part in ruling and in a sense they both had to sort of coexist together. 
Now the Sanhedrin was the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees, the rulers of the religious Jews. Now how many Christians do you think there were in the Sanhedrin? Not many. Why do I say not many? Because there was a man that was a part of that group called Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, okay? And whenever he believed on Jesus Christ, he didn't leave the Sanhedrin. So there was an influence there, but most of the people in the Sanhedrin were Old Testament believers, okay? They believed in the law and the Torah and so on. So they still had a remembrance of Jesus Christ, who they thought they'd gotten rid of when they hung him on the cross, but he came back to life according to his followers, you know. And, and here his followers were making trouble for the Jewish community and the Jewish Sanhedrin, the, the, the religious leaders. And Herod was trying to control them because Herod could only stay in power as long as he kept the people uh, living peacefully, okay? In other words, they were, they were living, what's that phrase, um, politically correct. He had to keep everybody, the Sanhedrin, uh, the Jewish people, this sect of Christians. Everybody had to have political correctness or Rome would come in and take Herod's power away from him. And that's what Herod did not want to do is that power taken away. So here he was and he was trying to appease the Sanhedrin, the Jews. And what he found out in the first part of verse 12 here, if he persecuted and killed Christians, he could please the Sanhedrin. Okay, you see that in verse, uh, well, let's read verse 1. And about the same time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, Christians. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now, what did he take him and do with him? He put him in prison. Okay. But God looked at that and said, it's not Peter's time to die. Okay? So what we're going to read down through here is the fact that uh, God freed Peter from prison. Now if we come back on it, I'm going to stress the point that Peter had jailers that were keeping him. And whenever God freed Peter from prison and took him back to the door and he knocked on it and Rhoda was in there and said, Peter's here. And everybody said, no, it's his ghost. Peter's in jail. You know, y'all remember the story. Okay. But whenever he freed him, you know what happened to that jailer? Herod had him executed. He had all of his family executed because he lost his prisoners. Now there's a good teaching there. Why did God let that man suffer for something that he did and is using in his word right now for us? And I'm not going to touch on it, but that's food for thought, okay? This is a transition time and God's using all these things as he comes down here. Now, what I want to get to today. Go down to verse 21 in chapter 12. This man, Herod, he's persecuting the church. And uh, he's trying to keep up his own appearances. He likes attention. He likes power. He likes riches. Okay? And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of man. And immediately the angel of the Lord, who's the angel of the Lord in most situations? He's the archangel. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. Okay, That's another synonym for Jesus Christ smote him because he gave not God the glory. Now there's the key phrase, okay? That's what I'm working down to here. 
he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. What did God do to a self-centered, vain man who did not give God the glory for what he could do in his life? Herod gave a good speech. Okay? But who gave him the power to speak and to touch men's hearts and minds? Like Who gave him the power to do that? God. You and I have gifts and abilities. Okay? As a matter of fact, back uh, in 16, 17, 18, and 19, I, I said from the pulpit here a couple of times, I wish I could go talk to Trump because he needs to understand that he don't need to stand up and say, I did this, I did that, and look what I did, and so on and so forth. He, if he's a born-again child of God and he was claiming to be, he needs to learn how to say, God allowed me God made it possible for me God used me to do these things and that's the lesson I want you to walk away from this sermon from this morning God is going to make you and give you the ability and give you the situation and he's going to bring you into the circumstances to where you can do some great things in this world for him and for other people and we need to remember to give God the glory. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. To God, did you ever notice what I say most of the time? I try to remember to do it. When you when I, you go out, every now and again, one of you will say, that was a good sermon, Pastor. What do I reply with? Okay, not exactly, but that's what it meant. Give God the glory. To God be the glory. That's, that's what I try to keep up here. Because it's awful easy, you know, whenever you please uh, the, the needs of people and the minds of people, uh, you could really get to thinking swell, you know. And I don't want to be eat up of worms. I'd say that's right painful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, seriously. We give God the glory. And no matter what it is, maybe it's I'm just a real good house cleaner, you know. And I do a real good job. Well, I don't, but maybe you do. A real good job at that, you know. Well, God gives you the ability. You know, whatever it is, teaching, uh, uh, sharing with others, uh, uh, baking, you know. And then it says, verse 24, after God did this, but the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem. In all of this, God is glorified. God is glorified. Let's look back. Uh, John chapter 3 and verse 30, uh, 26 through 36. John, book of John, chapter 3, 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from where? Heaven, from God. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. And that hath the bride, uh, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and beareth, heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore is for, this is my joy, therefore fulfilled. He must, what? Increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony uh, hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent 
speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Now, remember that, okay? God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, did not give a measure of the gift to the Son, to Jesus Christ. He has all of it. He is 100% God. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But he, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, turn over, if you will, with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, you catch that? By God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly uh, than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. In other words, I'm not worthy, Paul says, but I love Christ, I believe Christ, I surrender my life to Him, and by the grace of God, He makes me who I am, what I am. I can do what I can do because of the power of God. He's giving God the glory. Okay, flip back and I'm going to wind up on this ver uh, several verses here. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, again Paul writing to the church of Ephesus. Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 7. But unto every one of us is given. You hear that? Who is it given to? Every born again child of God. To every one of us is given grace according to the, what? Measure of the gift of Christ. Christ got it all without measure. He had it all. But he's given me a measure of the gifts that he has given me. Am I the orator and, and the Bible theologian uh, that Charles Stanley is and has been through the years? Or Adrian Rogers? No. I don't have that reach. God didn't give me that measure. But what measure he did give me, he gave me. I can stand here and I can explain and teach the word of God with authority because God gave me the measure he gave me. Okay? You the same way. He has given to every one of us one or more gifts. And we will teach sometime on the gifts of the Spirit. Okay? But he's given you those in measure. But God gave it to us, okay? God's the one that has given it. Therefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, now this is the scripture I was telling you about a while ago. When Jesus ascended to heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection, he led captivity captive. He took paradise and he took it up with him. And gave gifts unto men. Transition period. At this point, whenever Jesus went to paradise and took those souls to heaven because he'd paid the sin debt already, and he took them up so they'd be with the Father, and then he came back to this earth, the Holy Spirit, he was introducing him to the church. And as he gave the church the Holy Spirit and the ministries of the Holy Spirit, he gave every born-again child of God of the first century, and from then on, one or more gifts of the Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. When he ascended up on high, led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now, it's an explanation here in the next two verses. Now that he ascended, what is it, but that he also did what first? He descended to the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Okay? 
Now, he goes into the gifts that were given. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay? He's given partial list of gifts. Not all of them. Partial here. Okay? But he gives these things. Why did he give men gifts? To edify his body, this church. Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a, it says perfect in my translation, but it can also be translated from the original text, mature, full grown. Okay? The mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carry about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. Now that's what I was combating last week in Sunday school. Okay? The cunningness, the slight of men, the, the misinformation, the heresy that men teach in this world. And God doesn't want us blown every which way. But He wants us through the power of the Spirit and by us taking the gifts that God has given us and the power of the Spirit and helping each other to grow into the perfect or mature Christian. That's a good definition of the local church. Okay? But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. In other words, every born-again child of God in this fellowship needs to be using their gift to their fullest by the power of the Holy Spirit so that this body of believers, this local church, can be what God would have it be. Okay? And that's what Paul's saying here. And then if we go on in verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth, now that you're saved, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Don't walk around like an airhead. That's what that word vanity means, empty. Don't walk around, you know, you've got a purpose. You've got gifts. Uh, you're called to, to do something in this world. And I told you last week, whenever uh, you get done with what God has you to do in this world, what's he going to do? He's going to take us home because this is not our home here. But whenever we get done with it, he's going to take us home. So don't walk around with empty heads. Don't have your understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. In other words, live your Christian gifts and walk and power of the Holy Spirit to its fullest. Okay? Don't just idle along and say, well, I'm going to heaven. That's all I need. Now I'll live the way I want to here. That doesn't work. Because there is a sin unto death, okay? If, if we don't do what God wants us to do, you'll say, okay, you're not going to do it anyway. Come on home. Come on. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation. Now that's lifestyle, okay? Put off the former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. 
Be ye angry. It's okay to get upset. It's okay to be disgruntled, okay? Be ye angry. What does it say next? And sin not, okay? In other words, we don't strike out in anger. We don't let anger fester in us. What do we do whenever we get upset? What do we do, in, uh, according to Galatians, when we see a brother in a fault? What do we do when we see a brother in a fault? We go to that brother in meekness and in fear and try to correct him. Winning back to Jesus, okay? In love. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That's, that's a good uh, lesson for married folks. Don't go to bed mad at each other. Stay up till you talk it out. You love it out. You smooch it out. Whatever you got to do. You get rid of it. Don't take it to bed with you. Neither give place to the devil. Now what does that mean? Whenever we let things fester within us, whenever we're living outside the will of God, whenever we have hard feelings between family members or friends or church members, we're allowing Satan to slip in there. Now, can he take over? Can he possess my body? No, because the Holy Spirit's in here, okay? Can he have an effect on the outside of my being? Yes, he can. Don't give him place. And again, he goes on to say, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may give to him that hath need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now what does that mean? That means that when I, as a born-again child of God, do something that is contrary to God's person, to God's character, then I grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay? What does it mean to grieve? They're sorry. They feel bad. You know, because we have done something that is contrary to God, we brought shame upon His name. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Oh, God is trying to get across to the church. What is this transition time? It's a time whenever God's going to give us all the strength and power and, and everything we need through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit that lives in us, the gifts, uh, the ability. He's going to give it all to us. Now I need to live in a clean vessel that is, brings glory to God and doesn't detract from God and living in this clean vessel, making myself what God would have me to be and do the work of the Holy Spirit because we don't have much time. Not much time at all. You know that Jesus may come at any moment. Every prophecy that needs to be fulfilled up to the rapture of the church has been fulfilled. It's there. Jesus could come at any moment. Not only that, our children grow up real fast. Amen? I was looking at Facebook. I keep up with a lot of people. And I see Rob's boys. Boy, that one's a teenager, isn't he? Didn't he just have his 13th the other day? It was just a couple of weeks ago they sat back here little bitty fellers, you know. As a matter of fact, we had them up here and dedicated them, didn't we? We don't have much time to reach not only our kids and our grandkids, but the people around us, you know. Go ye into all the world and do what? Father, we give you glory and praise and honor.
Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Thank you for the power through the Holy Spirit that you give us. Thank you for your guidance. And praise to your holy name what do you allow us to be a part of in this world. And we give you glory and give you praise. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.